everyone. Uh, welcome to Adiva's Fireside Chats. I'm very excited to have Richard Varro with me here today. Uh, we will be discussing the challenges, the potentials of immersive AI, what immersive AI actually is. Uh, it, it's an exciting um, thing, exciting discussion. Uh, Richard will uh, brief us a bit more uh, on that shortly. Um, uh, you you can leave your questions in the Q&A uh, section. We will circle back to those at the end and try to incorporate uh, as many as possible uh, in the discussion uh, and hopefully answer a lot of uh, the questions that are out there with uh, the rapid development uh, of AI, generative AI that has become part of most of the uh, work environments. People are heavily relying on that. Uh, so there are a lot of questions like, uh, will my job become redundant? And uh, what will happen a few years from now? Uh, so uh, I'll, I, I would like to address uh, as many of those uh, today. Richie has an exciting theory that um, I will uh, leave uh, to him to share with us. Uh, and um, hopefully we'll answer a lot, uh, many more of uh, your own questions on the topic. Uh, so, without further ado, Richie, welcome and thank you so much for accepting our invite. Well, hi, Kate. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, I am a geek uh, on the inside. And so anytime I get to uh, engage with a technical audience or engineers or anyone in the technical realm, I'm very excited about it so I can be comfortable with the language. Um, when I'm in other audiences, I have to kind of businessify uh, the language, so to speak, but I'm really, really excited to just go in 4K here. That's perfect. Uh, so just uh, as a background, uh, you are a co-founder, uh, chief technology, chief creative uh, officer at Mobius and an immersive AI pioneer. Uh, so uh, there is a lot of background over there, a lot of things that you can uh, share with us. Let's start with a quick introduction. What, what do you do at Mobius? What is immersive AI? Uh, how is it going to change uh, the world as we know it today? Very good. So um, Mobius is where I am right now. Um, this is my second startup. Um, my first startup was in privacy and data rights as a human right. And prior to that, I was an, what do you call an intrapreneur? I was in large corporations with C-suite titles at the frontier of technology and new markets. So this is kind of a natural progression. Um, some people do startups and then they go to the enterprise. Some people do enterprises and then they go to the startups. Um, so at Mobius, I'm co-founder and the CTO and chief creative officer. Um, one third of my time is, is the backbone of the engineering and the invention and the core technology. Uh, one third of my time is how do we apply this technology to really interesting use cases. I'll show some of the showcases here today of what we're working on. So that's more of the creative side. And then one third of my time is managing, you know, the day-to-day -day operations of the business right now, specifically around capital raising, uh, et cetera. So that makes up um, the gist of it. But to be quite honest, that's a really um, sophisticated uh, uh, description of it. As a startup co-founder, you are doing everything every day. Um, and so it's a lot more helter-skelter than that. But if I were to try to put it into three packages, that's kind of what I, um, uh, I'm doing at Mobius. We've been in stealth for about two and a half years. Um, we've engineered quite a bit uh, during that time, and we just got out of stealth, and we're starting to show the technology. So I'm super in interested in showing it here, specifically around immersive AI. Um, so this is machine learning, um, and so you'll see aspects of, of machine learning in here. This is computer vision in real time, and it's principles of the natural user interface. So machine learning, computer vi vision, and what we call NUI, the natural user interface. If you've seen uh, the command line user interface and then GUI, this is NUI. Think about it like minority report on the outside, the metaverse on the inside, but absolutely no hardware or headsets. Nice, interesting. Uh, I think it will make uh, much more sense uh, for the audience when we actually see uh, what the product does. Uh, but we, before we, we get there, uh, let's talk about uh, the vision uh, first. Like, uh, how do you uh, imagine uh, the future, like the far future of work, as you uh, like to, to put it? Uh, how will it look like? Uh, we are already uh, in the midst of something that's uh, rapidly changing. Uh, we, we've had the future of work already until a couple of years ago, we were all stuck in an office, uh, following the, the same rules that uh, people 
years before us had, uh, and now everything is rapidly changing from remote, remote work to uh, using AI tools for uh, a lot of the mundane tasks. Uh, people are afraid uh, of losing their jobs because uh, AI is becoming more and more powerful. So uh, we see a lot of uh, new things coming up. Like the other day I saw Photoshop is uh, now using generative AI as well. So there, there will be uh, a threat to creative uh, uh, profiles and positions also. How do you see all of this unraveling and how does immersive AI fit into the picture? So, so I think um, the first thing I would say is we can all calm down. Um, the world's not gonna end. Everybody's not gonna lose their jobs. Um, we have gone through things like this before. And let me put, let me put it into context. Um, just just a few comedic uh, statements first like all the futurists from five years ago are now boring because the future that we were talking about five years ago is now here there's been a massive acceleration of that future every futurist is now like oh my god what am i going to do everything that i thought was going to happen is about to happen right so as a futurist um, you know we're kind of in the future right now and there's been a massive acceleration of many 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 things uh, even if from a board perspective, like all the big companies that were doing digital transformation, remember when it was supposed to take three to five years to get on the cloud and to get, you know, mobile apps and stuff, all of that was done in the first three to six months of COVID. And suddenly there's this acceleration and this sort of thirst and vacuum for digital transformation in the future. So, so there's a compression in time. Um, generative specifically, and I'll put the things into context in a second, is just a next generation of something that we've always gone through as a human species. And let me let me put this into sort of a frame. For those, I don't know how old everyone is on, on the call, so I'll, I'll try to not age us, but like my grandparents were what were called manual workers. The way they provided utility was in farming, in welding, in carpentry. You had to learn a trade. That was the, the human utility of the time. And prior to that, there was something else. There was a whole other version of how you how we, we found utility. And there's always been resets uh, over time. Now, Peter Drucker, one of the most famous, I think, management uh, sort of visionaries in the work, came up with this really awesome concept that said manual workers are going to become knowledge workers. And most of us are knowledge workers today. Now, when that idea first arrived, it was pretty scary. It was like, hmm, what's going to happen? I remember my grandfather saying to me right before college that, Richie, you need to learn a trade. Uh, you know, you need to learn welding or carpentry. And I'm thinking, no, 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 no. I'm going to go learn computer science, right? And he was nervous. Like, where is this guy going to find work with this computer science, right? There's only like 500 people in the world that are needed right now, right? So this kind of feeling that we're feeling is what, you know, two generations ago fell, which is work is going to change. And when work changes, it changes fundamentally, like the shoes that you wear change, right? The, the hours that you go to sleep and when you wake up change, family dynamics change, the, the knowledge workers and the ability to have salary introduced credit. So now you can have credit cards and all this type of buying patterns. So everything changes fundamentally. When you examine that change from manual work to knowledge work, you'll see a lot of similarities of what's about to happen today. There's three components to it. One is there has to be massive economic shock. There's always some massive economic shock in the mix, okay? Two is there has to be a big invention that commoditizes the current way of working. And three is there has to be a big invention that introduces a new way of work. And the last time the macroeconomic shocks were two world wars, Right, so the whole world got reset economically. The big invention was the motor. It was the motor that actually commoditized manual work. Now I was living in South America when I saw the motor for the first time. The only thing I could think about was how do you make a fan out of it? Because it was hot, right? So you would make a fan. Mm. We didn't see all the machinery that would be built and all the automation that we yeah. built, right? And Caterpillar and Hymax and all that type of stuff. But the motor commoditized manual work. And at the same time, the PC was invented, which introduced knowledge work. And so we saw this transition, right? Now it took about a hundred years. It was two generations and it took about a hundred years. We're seeing the same thing today. We're just seeing the macroeconomic shocks of COVID. 
massive macroeconomic shock. Now, this is going to be bigger than World War II because this was all countries, all genders, all ages, all religions were affected here for about a year and a half to two. And we're seeing the, this massive invention of this thing called generative, which is threatening to commoditize knowledge work, and, and it probably will. But as humans always do, we find a new type of work. I think the new type of work that we're going to is what I call visionary work. So we went from manual work to knowledge work to visionary work. And in order to do visionary work, there has to be some other invention that has to happen. I believe that's immersive AI. And immersive AI allows you to transfer more between each other on the screen. And I think those who go from just sharing and finding information to starting to share and find ideas and starting to share and find imagination that's going to be the people that are going to move into visionary work or faster. We're not all going to lose our jobs. Every company is not going out of business. But what will happen is what we do will change fundamentally. Awesome. Very inspiring. Let's see a quick uh, demo of uh, what it is, how it works. And then I want to dig more into uh, the technical side, how it works in the background, uh, maybe something around regulations. Uh, but I think just uh, putting it out there for the audience to see uh, will help everyone to uh, digest um, the concept better. Excellent. So I will uh, I will share my uh, my screen. So let me uh, go back to Zoom here and see where I am. There is Zoom. There is the share button. And uh, excellent. And I will share my screen. Can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes. Okay, so just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, and you'll notice that my screen is moving around here for a second. You'll understand this. Actually, I'll just hit join so that my video will, um, will reflect. So a little bit of housekeeping. This is my Mac. This is commodity hardware. Um, I don't have any special thing on my computer. There's only software on my computer. I don't have any sensors in my home office. I don't have anything that I'm wearing on my body. This is just me as a human being and my computer, okay? And what you're going to notice is that I have placed uh, my video and myself in what seems like a virtual world, right? This is a regular GLTF uh, sort of standard virtual environment. And immediately you'll see that in some way, this thing is calculating my viewing intention. As I lean in, the screen leans in for me. As I lean out, the screen leans out and leans away. Now you're seeing my reflection of this. So you're not getting this perception of depth that I'm getting. I'm getting a really intimate feeling with this capability. I actually feel like the depth of the screen is moving towards me. So if I move my head down to the corner, I can kind of look right down here from the floor. Or if I move my head over this side, you can see that the relationship between my viewing intention and the screen is one that's a lot more intimate. I feel like I am in the room. Now I can do demonstrations where we have other people back here and they are looking at this same environment and they're looking at it from their perspective without changing mind. And we're both having this experience where we feel like we're in a shared reality at the same time. That's a very simple illustration of this, right? Obviously, if you can get my viewing intention, to be able to do things like this, and you've seen this in VR before, you've seen some of this in AR, this is without any hardware, you can absolutely get my interactive intention as well. So, you know, my hands can come to life. For example, you know, using some of the machine learning models that we have, we've been able to figure out gestures and with real-time computer vision, if I put my index finger and my thumb together, I can start to draw in the air with pretty decent precision here, right? This is, uh, this is fairly precise. Um, and we're continuing to make uh, uh, improvements on this as we continue to engineer this. If I lean in, I lean into that ink. You'll also notice that if I shift to the side, I've sort of drawn into the depth here where I was drawing in the physical world, but is drawing into the virtual world at the same time. We're working through the most natural gestures that you can find. We're geeks, so we figure, you know, thumbs down to kind of erase, which is probably not a good gesture to figure to, to take into public. But we're having my viewing intention and my interactive intention process at the same time. So this is processing the frame buffer of the camera and amending the frame buffer of the screen in real time to create what is this programmable interactive perception of depth. 
technologically, this is programmable. Right now, we've programmed this reality called Monarch, where when I lean in, it zooms in. But if I lean in, it could also run away from me. You know, we've tuned sort of the sensitivity of my head movement or the speed and the reactivity. All of that could be programmed into completely different realities. My hands could also engage with the content uh, and with the virtual world. So you should be hearing sort of like random guitar notes that are being played over here. Um, this works in any app. So um, you could build this with any language right now. We're racing to write SDKs. This also works on the web. We can deliver this experience over a link, runs on any browser, on a Mac or a PC. It's WebGL on the other side. We're writing JavaScript SDKs. Um, we have some early adopters who are starting to experiment with what an immersive and interactive website uh, might feel like. Let me show you some of the showcases that we've built out with some of the early, early, early proof of concepts that we're working on. Remember, we just started showing this out in the public. Um, I'm going to raise my hands like this to kind of raise a couple of showcase experiences here. Um, these are of different types. As I lean in, they kind of zoom in. My hand gets the benefit of hovering like a mouse, um, so I can kind of pick these up as I go. From a collaboration standpoint, so if I just make a fist here, this should open this. In our collaboration use case, hold on a second. In our collaboration use case, you know, what this does is it puts me in a completely different room and I can bring up my slides that I want to present here. So just like I was able to hover over the showcases, I can put my hand over this slide. If I make a fist, it goes green and I can just pull this slide open into the air. I can grab it and push it back and close the slide. I'll do that again to just open it. If I wanted to change the slides with my hands, I just put it on the side and swipe the slide. I can draw on the screen as I see fit. And this is completely collaborative. We have a CPAS behind here. We can connect people together. They're in the shared environment. They can change the slide. I can change the slide. You know, we can close the carousel. We can open it. And this is a prototype that we wrote that we call the carousel for the presentation of the future. Um, there are healthcare examples, so I'll just show you two more here, and then I'll stop this demo. This is one where we're working with a pharma company. I'm going to turn down my video here so you can kind of see this is kind of like a futuristic lab. So this is a pharmaceutical doctor and a rep that would be in here. You know, integrate Salesforce data. This is in 2D and just pull it right into the screen so you can lean in and look at it and point at it and draw on it when you feel like. Um, we're bringing in digital twins into here. So this is from the pharmaceutical company themselves. This is a twin of their beating heart running on some simulated data. I'll put my hands up and just grab this heart and start to spin it around and bring it towards me. I'll lean right in and look into that artery. So things like this is what we've been engineering um, here. This is a, a sort of a movie scene, right? Um, it's kind of a scene from Finding Nemo. Um, I'll show you what's happening here. I can spin this around so you can get a point of view as to what I'm actually doing, I'll zoom out with my hands on a gesture. If I lean in, you know, I'm leaning into the movie or I'm leaning out from the movie at the same time. Um, not, that, not that this is a particularly commercially applicable experience, but just to demonstrate the fact that using the machine learning to be able to calculate the viewing intention and the interactive intention and the real-time computer vision to really create this perception of depth, we can kind of program these experiences together. Last thing I'll show you is that you know, we can put you on a flight path so we can build a flight path. Here, I'm not moving. I'm not moving at all. The camera is just spinning. And, you know, I'm going to put my hands in the air and start to draw into this 3D environment that is playing this movie animation at the same time. And you'll see that as I, I wave my hands up and down, I'm drawing into the depth at the same time as this camera is spinning. I'm not trying to sell more fish but I'm just trying to demonstrate how we bring the virtual world and the physical world together in this programmable interactive perception of depth that really allows you to do so much more through the screen now. So I'll just take my hands and spin this around so you can see what's happening here. So if you think about this from a remote collaboration standpoint, from a telehealth standpoint, from an early education standpoint, this is what I mean by if we're going to be more remote, and I think the cat is out the bag on that, we're going to have to be able to transfer more through the screens that we already have. I'll stop sharing here and come out back to the conversation. Great. Thank you, Richard. It was uh, exciting to see. Uh, can we talk a bit about the 
the technology behind it? Like, how does it work? Uh, is it also tracking eye movement or just uh, the the like physical movement of the head uh, to calculate the depth? How how does it every how does everything work in the background? Uh, what are the technical complexities uh, of building uh, such a product? The skill set that you had to work with uh, a bit more uh, on that side. Yeah, so so the complexity comes in three categories. Um, one first is machine learning. So there's a lot of machine learning that's been done on sign language uh, already, right? And there's a lot of machine learning and models that have already been trained for face mesh. Um, first part of it was to really just break it down to only the things that we need uh, to be able to achieve this. So if I were to connect you on the other side of this, you wouldn't need to scan your hands or scan your face. It doesn't care about my hands versus your hands or my face versus my face. We did a lot of work to break down the heavy stuff that was there and then reorient it to what we wanted. Um, we call this a zero privacy footprint. Um, as you will find out, I'm a privacy nut. Um, so we don't capture any information specifically about you or your environment. We had tuned and tweaked and trained the models to be generic to any human. Now, saying any human is um, is difficult. Um, you know, we have found um, sort of like accessibility use cases where someone may may not have all five fingers, but they may only have three fingers. That we still have to do some work there from an accessibility and an inclusion standpoint to make sure that we can preserve that zero privacy, right, or that full privacy, so to speak. So that's one part of it. The second part of it is really putting together how does it work in the different types of media. So how does it work in Unity? How does it work in Unreal? Um, how does it work in Horizon? How does it work in Decentraland? How does it work in Matterport? How does it work in Roblox? How does it work in the NVIDIA Omniverse? And that's a lot of sort of, you know, camera management, depth management, um, tuning, um, you know, APIs, plugins, all that type of stuff to be able to make sure it can work across the board. Um, how do we get it to work on the web? Right, and how do you write in a rendered environment and export into the web stack and bring all that integration into the immersivity and the interactivity together? And then third, which is probably the hardest part, is how do you hammer that down so that the fans are not spinning and the computer is not laggy and the experience is not jittery, right? So that's been the three buckets of complexity. But during the first year of, of Mobius, it was more like hitting your head on a brick wall, hoping to see a piece of light. Because now that we look back at it, it was like, of course, that's how you would do it. You'd put the following pieces together, take this model, that model, optimize it here, rip this one apart, you know, take all this stuff that is CPU intensive, move it to the GPU, right? Um, for the web, you know, let's use WebAssembly, like that's easier, right? The C++ libraries weren't there, but in Rust, we can pull this thing forward. But the first year was really dark. As a matter of fact, I would say in the first year of Mobius, uh, about month 12, I was ready to give up. Um, where we had changed engineering staff, we thought we were gonna be able to do it in C++, but certain things didn't work and we had to rush to find Rust engineers, right? Um, then once you got it to work and you got the basics together, you know, you have a prototype at that point. Then you got to tune it for scale, right? Um, this stuff, you know, the eye movement, you'd be surprised as to the landmarks on the face. So I think we use about only about eight landmarks on the face. There are there are many, many landmarks that you could get from a face mesh. Um, you know, your eyes move pretty quickly and jittery. The eye is an extremely nimble, jittery thing. And so we really had to tune that eye movement and throttle it. And it turns out that the nose was actually a better predictor of, of, of where someone is looking and, and in relationship to the eye, et cetera. Um, the hand is not as stable as you think. The hand is pretty unstable, right? And the data, especially since we're using basic uh, CMOS sensors uh, here, right? I mean, it's still RGB data, right? That's completely unpredictable. Um, we've then we had to do all the work for low light because this this Mac doesn't have a lighter on it, right? So all the low light work and all of the edge detection uh, that we needed to tune for the various gestures and stuff like that. So so that was the second part of it, and then the third part was you know really getting the fans. 
And I think the GPU is the savior there. If it wasn't for the GPU and some of the web GPU stuff that we're using, if it wasn't for GPU, I don't think we would be able to even try to bring this thing to market right now because the type of computation that has to happen here in real time is just hammering the CPUs. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So uh, a lot of challenges when uh, you were building the team, not only uh, from the perspective of, you know, the modern skill sets, uh, machine learning, AI, but also like basic programming skills and uh, optimization and that type of uh, background. Yeah, and we, we were born in COVID. So this entire team has been working remote. And, um, you know, it, it's kind of funny that people talk about whether remote work is here to stay. You know, um, I have been working remote or some blended form of remote for almost 10, 15 years. And I was going to an office, but I was still remote. Because the office that I was going to didn't have everyone that I needed to talk to. I was working in global international companies. I was physically in an office here in New Jersey, in the US, but 80% of my calls were still done over some sort of video conferencing solution because I'm talking to clients and colleagues from across the world, right? So this, this notion that has changed is that people are more at home uh, than they are in the office, but but even if you are in the office, a significant amount of the interaction that you still do are people who are not in the office at the same time. So this this kind of you know debate and tug and war between remote and hybrid, I think, is somewhat moot. We're going to have a blended collaborative environment, and it's going to blend physical and 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 digital together. Um, I think the challenge that we have is the volume of digital that we're using, right? So before COVID, you know, people who are meeting, you know, two times a day on WebEx, now they're meeting eight times a day on WebEx, right? Before COVID, people who had one camera and now post COVID, they have two cameras, right? Before COVID, people who had two cameras now have a room light, right? So it's like, <laughs> there's just so much more that's happening, but the tools haven't advanced. So Zoom and Teams were, you know, pre-COVID is like, oh, you couldn't make the meeting. No problem. You'll be this computer off into the side and you'll be this square box over here. And we'll kind of talk to you every once in a while. You know, it's like being on the polycom. Are you on mute? Are you not on mute? I'm hearing an echo. You know, that's what that these tools were meant to do. Even Zoom that we're on right now. They were never meant to be the primary communication mechanism right? The fundamentally primary communication mechanism. So given that the future has advanced by about 10 to 15 years, and if you look at all the forecasts of video collaboration consumption, it wasn't moving fast. Like, you know, cell phones move like this, televisions move like that, emojis move like this. As soon as everybody saw emoji, we all adopted it like <laughs> week, right? Fast. Emojis were adopted faster than ChatGPT. <laughs> right? <laughs> video was always kind of going very slow, a very slow adoption curve along the way. And boom, COVID comes in. And now we're all consuming this, this capability at the consumption level that was forecasted for 2035. So a 15 year advancement in the consumption level, but these tools haven't been able to actually get there because they would have had 10 more years of innovation before we would have been using it like this. So by definition, Zoom is 10 to 15 years old. This experience is 10 to 15 years old based on the consumption that I'm using it right now. So a lot of debate in remote work and hybrid work is not a people debate, it's a tool debate. The tools are not ready to service us yet. Not their faults. How, how the hell are they going to accelerate 15 years <laughs> of innovation very quickly? And that's why incumbents like Mobius have an opportunity to kind of introduce completely new interactive frameworks to be able to try to pass more over the screen because we are moving to visionary work. Like you just can't survive with PowerPoint and Excel anymore because that stuff's going to be commoditized. Now you have to go from information to imagination. Now you got to go from you know, visualization to experiences. And that's where I'm excited about where the future is going. If I forecast out all the way and you think about the brain computer interface and you know, we're getting pretty good at the, at the listen and output form of it. The input side is not in, it's there. But I see sort of interconnected imagination networks 
where I can share my imagination with you in real time across others. And I think that's how we're going to transcend artificial intelligence because we're sort of biologically limited by the amount of neurons that we can have. AI is not. So we're going to have to network our brains together, right, in order to manage this relationship. So I'm pretty bullish on the future, but I am also very sober in the fact that we're going to transform fundamentally what work feels like. Interesting. And what, what regulations do you uh, see in place uh, moving forward? I mean, these are, you know, uh, it's kind of scary uh, the way you're putting it, uh, the, the speed at which uh, it could develop. Um, there's a lot of debate right now for generative AI as well, how uh, regulated the industry is, what are the steps that should be taken uh, to ensure, you know, all of the ethical guidelines and regulations are met. Uh, what what's your point of view there? Well, I think that, you know, governments have a fantastic history of being behind science and technology. So I'm not optimistic that the governments are going to get ahead of it, which means that there is going to be abuse and misuse. Um, but there is going to be regulation without a doubt. There's going to be regulatory frameworks. Let me address that from three different vantage points. First of all, pausing doesn't make sense. For, physically, you can't because, you, you know, it's not like um, nuclear fission where like you could, you know, scan the world and see that it's happening over there, right? Anyone with, you know, a couple of hundred dollars of Amazon credit can kind of go to generative AI in their basement and there's not a good way to find it, okay? Um, so, so it's not, it's, it's hard to police. Second is um, e effectively, if we were to pause AI, what would happen is that the good guys and gals would pause, but the bad guys and gals would still keep going. And so you're creating an even worse problem at that point, because generative could, could and is being used for ethics, for cybersecurity, for all the type of protections that are going to be needed. And last but not least, the genie is so out of the bottle here. You know, like instead of trying to shove the genie back in the bottle, what we should focus on is what are the three wishes that we want from the genie, right? We're not going to be able to get it back in the bottle. Second is, you know, and, and I'll talk about what I think the regulatory framework challenges and opportunities are in a second, but we should probably kind of categorize the, the, um, the maturity and the sophistication of the technology, okay? Um, large, large language models um, are kind of like, the AOL chat moment. They're not the iPhone moment as yet. Uh, I hope that OpenAI does very well, but I would say chat GPT is going to be like AOL chat in about 10, 15 years. You know, some people are still going to use it and some people still have AOL and AIM email addresses, right? We have not seen the curve as yet. The iPhone moment is not here as yet. There's a lot of people um, that have invented things that didn't make money from it. Like refrigeration, if you think about the inventors of refrigeration, some of them made money, but you know who made a lot of money from refrigeration? Coca-Cola, <laughs> right? So I think this technology has got a long way to go. Now it's exciting. It's as exciting as the AOL CD when you got it the first time and you can pick a name and chat with people, but it's got a long way to go, which means that, um, the, the maturity of it is going to mature from both good use and bad use at the same time. Good actors and bad actors are going to be in this dance together for a long time. Um, I believe that the risk, however, is the speed at which it is moving. There's an exponentiality to this particular phenomena that we didn't have in the motor, right? We didn't have with farming. We didn't have with fertilizers, right? We didn't have with electricity. There's this massive exponentiality where we have to act fast. And this is where I think the regulations are going to have to really focus on speed more than precision, right? Regulations by definition, kind of they folk, you know, there's a negotiation that has to happen and it has to take a couple of years and a couple of political cycles have to get expended on it. We don't have that luxury right now. We've got to act fast. And the things that are important are the following. One is the ownership and sanctity of the data, right? Look, look we probably shouldn't just all freely give all of our data away to automate ourselves. That's probably not a good idea. And I can talk to you about a little bit about the 31st human right, about data rights and all that type of stuff. So that's number one. Number two is there's a lot of 
ethical personalization frameworks that are needed to make sure that we don't have a variance in the benefit or the effect of the technology. For example, I debate with ChatGPT all the time. I argue with it, okay? And I argue with it in English in the way that I usually write sentences, but I grew up in South Jamaica, Queens, okay? And if I were to use my, my sort of, you know, my, my, my sort of um, hip hop, uh, because I grew up in hip hop in a hip hop community. If I go, what's up, bro? How do I do this? It doesn't understand me, right? It doesn't quite get that. And so linguistics matter here. Certain communities are not going to be able to get the power of generative AI simply because of how we frame words and sentences together. If if English is your is your is your second or third language, you might not be able to be served appropriately. So there's a lot of invariance that's going to have to be regulated. And then last but not least. I think we're going to have to think about the ownership and control structures of the of the models, right? So, you know, is one chip going to rule the world or not? Is one model going to rule the world or not? Is it going to be publicly owned or privately owned? Is open source going to be the path of the future or are we going to see for profits? So it's a very scary time. I understand what I'm saying is we have had scary times before as a species. And we have always transcended those scary times. And we still have a lot of headroom left. Here's what I mean by that. The average human being only uses about 5% of our brain. Maybe our audience here is using seven, <laughs> okay, right? So we still have a lot of work. To, we still got a lot of headroom. And this has been moving. It's not like, it's not like we were all born and for the last 100,000 years, we were using 5% of our brains. No, we've been increasing how much of our brains that we use. You know, if you take religion out of the conversation temporarily and respectfully, at one point, we were just grunting at each other. We were using less than 1% of our brain at that point. So we still got a lot of headroom to go. I'm excited to get up to 8% if I can, right, to start to compete with, with AI. Humans and AI are going to dance. The question is who's leading the dance, right? And I think we've seen some, i, I tell you one of the things that I see that's positive, just the naming of AI. Right. In the past, the artificial intelligence had names that were kind of, you know, powerful and, and sort of draconian, you know, Watson and Holmes. Right. Now you're seeing servant names like Jarvis and Alfred. Right. So we've started to put AI into like servant intelligence. Right. As opposed to dominance intelligence. So I think a lot of the maturing is going to happen over time. It's going to be a bumpy road for a little bit. But I'm not, I'm not thinking that there's going to be an apocalypse. I think we're over-sensationalizing it right now a little bit um, for reasons that obviously everybody's looking for attention, right? But this too shall pass. That's my message. That's amazing. It's always so easy. I mean, we are in the middle of it and it's hard to just step back, look at the big picture, look at the future, what it might hold. So... I, I like the way you put it, like, uh, we shall dance. The question is, who will lead uh, the yep. dance? It's an amazing way to put it. Um, when it comes to data privacy, we talked about uh, full privacy at Mobius, uh, not getting, you know, specific data for, for the users. Um, how about uh, everything else uh, the users interact with, like their, the slides, um, uh, the telemedicine, I can't uh, even imagine what type of uh, usage there would be and uh, what type of data there, there will be that uh, the users will need to interact with. Uh, what are the, is that regulated uh, or are you following some ethical guidelines uh, around that? Uh, can you tell us a bit more about that part? Yeah, so we've insulated ourselves away from that to making sure that we don't need anything unique about the human in order to generate the immersivity and the interactivity. So that's principle one. Everything above that is a business model question, right? So that's a technical infrastructure code level question. We've kind of drawn the line on that. So we can always exist at zero. Right. The business model question is, OK, now that I have an idea what you're looking at, what you're touching, um, is there an analytics business model on that? Right. Where, you know, you could take Google Analytics out, for example. We are not we're not interested in that business model. What we want to do is we want to be a component provider for engineers. We want engineers to use our technology to dream and imagine with creators and designers the best products that they can they can envision. 
we're not we're not looking at a business model where we're going to try to take over ad tech. Um, not because it's not any, uh, uh, financially attractive. It certainly is financially attractive. I just don't think that's where culture goes. I don't think that we're going to continue these predatorial practices and dark patterns around cookies and the rest of the stuff that we see today, right? Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, one of the other things that we've been thinking about carefully is, you know, what is the most natural uh, 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 set of gestures? What's the most natural, the most broadest re reaching set of gestures that we can have? Because what we don't want to have is we don't want to have you know, every website that you go to, you got to kind of learn how to use it or every app that you interact with, you got to learn how to use it. Um, you know, this thing works with any camera and frame buffer. So if you put a camera on the TV, you can swipe your TV channel if you write an app on Ubuntu, right? Or or, or some of the Linux-based television uh, systems. So we, we're, we're really focused on being the technology component provider and then being that standardized UI, that UX, that standardized UX. And, and what happens in the middle is really we're leaving that up to developers and, and creators and engineers to be able to figure out what that looks like. Um, the business model question is obviously the hardest one and the one that usually doesn't age well. I can tell you right now as a human being from a purpose perspective, given my um, deep uh, commitment to privacy, I'm not looking at an ad tech business model. We're looking at a tech provider business model. But you know, I've seen many people say that, and then they rolled out an ad tech business model because they couldn't figure out monetization. So I hope that my words age well, but that's our core intent right now to be able to manage privacy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that sounds very good. It's it's really hard to just jump out and go, oh, we'll never do that, <laughs> right? <It's better laughs> to, just, to, to just be very honest and direct about where you are, what your intentions are, and the world will change, right? It always does. Uh, and how how do you see like we talked about immersive AI? It would change the uh, future of work, collaboration, and and all of that. Uh, but in in general, uh, and especially now with all of the jobs becoming redundant with uh, generative, um, how do you see what what would the role of AI be uh, in the work uh, workplace? How will it evolve? What are the potentially new jobs that you envision uh, opening up for for humans and all of the places where AI would uh, take over? Yeah, so so I think um, first and foremost, there's this debate about like, like whether AI is gonna take my job. You know, AI is gonna replace doctors, right? AI is gonna replace copywriters and artists and, and creatives. No, people who use AI in their field are probably gonna outperform people who don't use AI in their field. AI is not gonna, take out doctors. Doctors who use AI are going to take out doctors who don't use AI, right? It's like not having an 800 number or not having a website, right? <laughs> or, or not having, you know, a mobile phone or something like that, right? So I, I think first and foremost is embrace the technology. Um, it can be very, very, very useful. Um, our investor deck for our uh, pre-series save most of the language came from a large language model for me, and most of the art came from a generative uh, uh, AI engine. Uh, I mean, I'm using it myself, and I was able to generate a deck in two and a half days, whereas it would have taken us four weeks or five or six weeks to be able to do that, right? So first of all, look at what you're doing, look at what could be automated and commoditized, and use the capabilities to be able to take out that layer. And free up the time to be able to think more creatively, free up the time to be able to think more strategically, free up the time to be, be able to think more divergently, right? Because I think that's where we're going. We're going away from knowledge work where it's a search and find kind of relationship, right? It was inquiry for information. And we're going to visionary work where it's creativity in, inspiration out, right? And, and that cycle of creativity and inspiration is where I think that the real power of this opportunity is. Now, this also is not new. We have been commoditizing layers of what it takes to build companies for a very long time. There was a point that when I built my first company at 23, the servers were in the closet, right? Like, the, you know, we had a closet with servers and wires and cat fi cables all over the place, right? Um, 
when the cloud arrived, it was like, oh my God, what's going to happen to all the system engineers and all the people who, you know, manage the plugs? We have a guy named Mark Vasilko. He knew exactly how all those things work, right? Martin, Martin is still having a thriving career today, being doing something else in cybersecurity the last time I looked, right? Um, so, so what we're commoditizing here is information management, right? Knowledge management. And that's opening up visionary work and creative work. And I'm pretty excited about that. When I was a developer, it sucked just moving information around all the time. I wanted to get into the creativity. I wanted to get into the imagination, right? So I think this is an opportunity to commoditize where you're not using your brain, okay? To open up space for where you can use your brain more. I love it. Because we got a whole 95% still to go. <laughs> it will be an interesting time. Uh, one interesting question for, from the audience. Uh, it's great discussion. Uh, I'm moving toward a more immersive digital work environment, but I'm worried about the environmental impact. How do you expect an increase in adoption of this technology to impact our energy demands? Uh, this is a really astute question. Because a lot of people, when they talk about energy, they only talk about cars and airplanes and ships. They don't talk about processing power. Okay. And, and you know, <laughs> computers and clouds burn a lot of electricity. Okay. And chips uh, consume a lot of natural resources at the same time. Right. Um, what I will say is that we're probably not moving to a world where we're going to be completely regenerative anytime soon. Um, I think that what, and, and by the way, I just looked at um, Project Neom in, uh, in the Middle East, which are building a whole new city, right? From the ground up with the line in the desert and fully regenerative systems and all this type of stuff. That's probably one of the most ambitious human projects I've seen in my life. And they're trying to get to zero footprint, right? Fully regenerative systems. If you're building it from the ground up, you're going to be there. I think what's happening is we're shifting from one raw material to another. And we're shifting from one natural resource to another, right? We're shifting from oil and carbon to silica and lithium, right? And so that shift is what I see happening. And what's going to happen is that as we shift from one to the other, we're going to get a little bit more better. We've always gotten better about the planet over time. And then we're going to overconsume there. And then, then we're going to have to move to something else, right? And then we're going to get a little bit better and then we'll overconsume again. So I am fully, fully, fully aware that every time you write code, if you don't write the most efficient code, if you write code that's burning too much electrons, you're drawing too much electricity from the system. So as a programmer engineering community, we have a responsibility to write the most efficient code, not just to reduce the fans on the machine or to make the machine a little bit uh, uh, you know, less laggy, but to recognize that every time you write inefficient code, you're burning electricity, right? And so I think that's this awareness, I love the question because this awareness that technology actually has a carbon footprint is super important. I laughed the first time I went to Google's Wells website and it said carbon neutral since 2007. I was like, really? Google is carbon <laughs> How do you guys calculate that? I don't know, <laughs> right? Because I'm pretty sure your servers are burning up a lot of resources. So I, I really, I like this question because it raises this conversation to say that the IT technology community also has a responsibility to the amount of compute power that we use when we write software. Excellent. Uh, and, and how how do you see like Mobius uh, moving forward in terms of uh, you know optimizing the software, reducing the energy? Uh, have you been thinking about that uh, while you build a product, or is it something that will come at a later stage? No, it was, it was day one in the product. I got to tell you, though, <laughs> it's not easy to get there, especially since we're rendering, you know, full ray traced environment and processing two frame buffers at the same time. Um, what we have done, though, is we've really kind of tightened up the network, right? So when, when multiple people are, are connected to the space, and if you play a multiplayer game right now, you know the network bandwidth that's on that, right? So we really tightened up 
how much information is traveling over the wire. That's been our, our latest kind of like, let's tighten that up. Um, as far as processing is going, we've lowered the processing quite a bit. And that's not our invention. That's just really just going to the GPU. You know, going through the GPU is just faster, lighter, better for the environment and everything else. Um, what I think is going to be the most interesting, I think, from, a, from an energy responsibility standpoint, is going to be when the cameras get a little bit more efficient. These cameras are pretty inefficient right now, right? So there are there are things like um, uh, peros uh, what is it? Um, narrow band porosity um, photo capturers, new invention, different type of, of raw material where you don't use as much uh, enough uh, as much in electricity to capture the RGB. You don't have to apply filters to it. You'd be surprised to find out that the camera actually burns a lot, a lot, a lot of electricity, right? Sometimes, uh, depending on the camera that you have, if it's inefficient, it's actually burning more than the screen and the, and the LEDs. So I think camera technology is going to get a little bit better. That's going to help us a little bit. Um, I think chips are going to get more efficient. I think the M1 chip is applying pressure across the entire uh, chip industry, and chips are going to get more efficient. And screen technology is getting massively more efficient as well. So I don't think that um, technology is moving in that direction where it's actually being less and less responsible for the energy. I think by definition, by Moore's law, by definition, and sort of the repeats that we get and the improvements that we get, we're going to get better and better. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, we don't have any more questions uh, from the audience. Uh, anything you want to add to wrap up the conversation? It's been very inspiring uh, for me. I believe it's been the same for the audience. Uh, maybe a summary, maybe some final thoughts that you'd like to share. I think the far, the far future of work um, will transcend immersive AI. We are going to get to a point, we have to get to a point where we can transfer more than just um, language, text, and PowerPoint uh, between each other. And whether that is a more immersive interactive screen experience where gestures matter and immersiveness matter and tactile and haptics matter, or whether that is um, a transfer of you know, um, electric patterns from the brain to, to each other, um, we have to get there because the speed at which AI is moving is the most dangerous thing. AI is not dangerous. The speed at which it's moving is dangerous. And I think we as a species needs to get to a point where we can network our thoughts more effectively because we're limited biologically by the amount of neurons that we could have. Thank you, Richie. Uh, I believe we can have another session uh, sometime in the future to discuss this because I'm very intrigued by uh, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, the brain-computer interface is work, especially um, the work that's going on at Berkeley. One of my mentors, Bernd Hall, uh, Bernd Wall, uh, who was a, the, the sort of pioneer of Fractal, um, is working on a lot of that. And it's advancing quite a bit. That's another scary area, right? Reading brainwaves and understanding what people are saying and using machine learning to kind of build patterns around it. Think about the regulations that are going to be needed around that, right? But I think that's the next big advancement. I think human communication, human connection is the next big advancement. And I hope we do it responsibly. What's the current state of that technology? Is it something usable uh, at the moment? Well, or it's not it consumer research? ready. It's not consumerizable ready as yet. And it's an input output problem, right? So, you know, you can read brain waves um, and you know with EGs you can put them on on your head the scanning systems are getting lighter and lighter um, eventually I think it'll probably be something that's a combination of some sort of sensor right that could be able to pull that off so that's moving faster and there's quite a bit machine learning that's picking up patterns and you know you could tell if someone is afraid or not right um, things like that the input side you know, to put thoughts or to transfer my thoughts into your head. So getting it out of mind, there's a lot of advance, advancement there. So it's like a zero to one relationship between the brain and the computer. The computer can read my brain, but it can't pop it into yours, right? And so that input side is where I, that's where I think the scientific hurdles are. Um, again, think about ethics, think about privacy, think about regulation. 
But, you know, we are going to transcend how we communicate. We didn't always have language. Language was at sure. one point invented. We didn't always have reading. Reading was invented, right? We didn't always have music. Although I think we always had rhythm, but not necessarily music, right? Um, we didn't always have uh, uh, screens. We didn't always have uh, sound. You know, we didn't always have telephone. All of these things are increasing the aperture of how we exchange information with each other. And I think the next generation of that is we've got to be able to get more thoughts across to be able to network together. Don't forget, at one point, there was telegrams and just mailboxes, right? So that, too, has been expanding. So as we increase the use of our intellectual horsepower, we have to expand the aperture of our communication pipes. Right. You left a lot of uh, food for thought for everyone here. <laughs> Thank you for that. It's my uh, pleasure. I, I'd be happy to advance the conversation again. Um, love the work that you guys are doing. Uh, you know, remote is here and it's always been here and it's going to stay. We are in the future already. We got to prepare for the far future. Um, and uh, I'm really excited uh, to, to have met you um, and to, be, to have this conversation. Thanks. Yep, excited to have met you too. Thank you so much again for accepting our invites uh, for the inspiring conversation. Uh, hopefully we'll do it again uh, pretty soon. Excellent, thanks. And thanks to everyone who uh, was with us today. Uh, this will go out on our standard channels um, in the next couple of days. So uh, keep an eye on those if you want to rewatch anything, share it with friends. Uh, and uh, we'll see each other again next month. Bye.